Hi there, I'm Adrian Hernandez from Duke University, and I'm here with uh, Dick Wilkie uh, from ISPOR, and we're here to talk about our session that we just finished on real-world evidence as part of QCOR. Uh, the session was uh, really interesting on the ports of call on road to scientification regarding real-world evidence. And so in this session, you know, we really interested in understanding real data to real world evidence and actually how it can drive answers to common questions that people have. And so, and I'll just start off with uh, some of the things that at least came up uh, as part of my discussion. And then we'll ask Dick to talk a little bit about what uh, he uh, outlined as well as others. And so at least from my uh, point of view, everyone is really uh, needing answers all the time in terms of how to improve health. Uh, we have a problem where only 2% of people participate in clinical trials, yet we have to take care of the so-called other 98%. And if you think about COVID-19 and what has happened with the pandemic, with people wanting answers now, we really don't have easy mechanisms to get to answers quickly, although we should. Uh, the data are accumulating in a rapid fashion. We have new advances in methods, and we also uh, need to be able to understand what methods um, meet the right question. So one of the things that we're really interested in is actually what is real world evidence and how that actually translates into practice. And so the case here is that only 2% or so participate in clinical trials, yet we need to answer the questions for the other 98%. When you think about COVID-19 and the experience from the pandemic, people want answers now. Uh, they really can't wait. And so the question is, can you take advantage of the data that are accumulating rapidly, use the right methods to generate the answers? And also, when do you use certain methods, such as rapid cycle trials or observational um, methods uh, for generating evidence about what to do now? And so in our session, we really were tackling those key questions. What's it mean from an FDA perspective, or even Congress in terms of uh, real-world evidence? What are the different considerations for real-world evidence in terms of context uh, regarding data and quality? And um, what about the data that will matter, and where will it come from? And, and then also, like, how important is timeliness? As we know, um, getting to perfect, to uh, perfect data may take a longer time. So uh, do we need that? And what situations are we okay having a rough answer, if you will, in an earlier time frame? And so there are a lot of things that we can do now, and we also need to understand what we have to do uh, going forward in terms of having the right data, so-called fit for purpose at the right time. So Dick, uh, let me turn to you. Like uh, you have a, a really interesting uh, framework in terms of what you've been doing and also, uh, from an ESPOR uh, perspective, have really been leading uh, the charge in terms of uh, how we should do this. Uh, thank you, Adrian. Yes, uh, we think real world data is, is going to be and should be an important tool. Uh, there is a point of view, of course, that randomized control trials are, are the best evidence. That's probably true in, in most cases, but uh, it's, it's not the only evidence that we need, as you were saying. And one of the problem, one of the things we have to be clear on if rural evidence is going to be used for decision making is that it's it's reliable, that it's high, that it's trusted. And and so what I talked about was some of the ingredients of trusting data, uh, real world evidence that's drawn from real world data. Uh, there, there are I like to break it into four groups. One is the data, underlying data themselves have to be high quality data, not a lot of missing things, the right outcomes in the data, um, the right populations, those things. Duke Margolis, which is one of our partners, has laid out a very nice uh, outline of what in, what's involved with having high quality underlying rover data. A second ingredient is, is the appropriate methods. And there's been a ton of work at methods. This person's done some task force reports, but there are, there's a library of real world evidence methods. Um, there are quite a few and not everybody understands how well you can actually do to correct or at least adjust for some non-randomization biases with real world data. In the hands of truly strong analysts, they've been able to replicate trials, uh, understand what the biases are, 
do a really good job of almost replicating a trial with real world data. So there are methods there to get reliable answers out of it. Um, nothing's perfect and trials aren't perfect, so don't can't expect too much, but it's very good. A couple of more pieces are important, and that is transparency and reproducibility. Uh, one of the things about real world data is a lack of trust. Sometimes it's been tempting for people to take the answer they liked or use the methods that got the answer they liked. So an important part of being transparent is uh, what we would say is registering your protocol up front. And we're in the midst of an initiative to do that. And how do you can verify that this is really a prospective study based on retrospective real world data, which we, by which we mean administrative claims data or something gathered not necessarily for the purpose for which it's being analyzed. There are, other, there are some types of prospectively collective data. Uh, pragmatic trials, of course, is one. Registries are another. But there's a ton of electronic medical records data, billing data that's very useful that weren't collected for this purpose. It's important to prospectively say what your hypothesis is if you're going to create a result that can be used for decision. And of course, the fourth piece is um, reproducibility. One study is always one study, even in the trial world, but that's especially true in the world with data world. So you have to, if you're going to do a study, you should um, make enough information available that it can be replicated or reproduced, either in the same data or in different data. ISPOR and ISP have gotten together a joint task force that put out some standards here. We're in the second phase of setting up uh, registration uh, capability. We're working with some different app groups like clinicaltrials.gov, but also smaller ones to start making these registration sites really fit for purpose for real world evidence studies. And uh, we will be updating uh, folks as we get along. It's not ready to go yet, but um, uh, this is a big initiative for us. And Thanks for the opportunity to talk about that. One question for you. Um, you mentioned trust. Mm -hmm. and right now, um, uh, it seems like the public is trusting the media the most. And so, um, uh, and, and there's been a lot of attention to what you're describing in terms of the framing of uh, different qualities of uh, rural data, rural evidence. How do you translate that um, uh, to the, the public? Um, how should that be consumed? I think our first step has to be to educate the media. Uh, you know, they are uh, a key intermediary for us to communicate these results. And I think their uh, intentions are good. Um, I think sometimes their understanding is not quite as good. Uh, and we have to be, uh, I think that's an important goal for societies like ours to educate some of the communicators and make um, clear a very upfront, and I think it's the, very important for the researchers to make clear the strengths and weaknesses of their results um, in a world of preprints and getting data out as soon as possible. Sometimes that gets lost. And, and I think it's important for us to be uh, uh, very clear about uh, where our data came from, what our hypotheses were to start with, and um, what the strengths and weaknesses of, of the results are. Great. I fully agree. Well, Dick, uh, hey, thanks for uh, spending time with us uh, at QCore and sharing what is happening with this for driving uh, rural data uh, to rural evidence and the so-called scientification of this. And thanks you, to you all uh, for uh, joining us for QCore um, virtually. Uh, and hopefully this has been a stimulating uh, session uh, that you can uh, carry forward uh, to really change uh, rural evidence into ensure that it's uh, scientifically uh, robust and also used um, by the public in the very best way. Thanks. Thank you. It's been a pleasure.